Shabbat Shalom. Today we're going to finish out the series on Psalm 27. And, you know, hopefully by now you've recognized that Psalm 27 is loaded. Psalm 27 has profound insight prophetically. The heart and the wisdom that David displays in this psalm is incredible. The faith the hope, the clarity of mind that he has. Listen to me, you need this. What David presents, this clarity that he presents in Psalm 27, you need this as we turn into the pages of Revelation in this generation. As the scariest parts of the Bible begin to unfold, you better get this right. We, we need to get to the level David is at to be that homesick, to be that focused that you get to the point is, I'm out of here. I want to go home. I want to be with the Lord. That's the one thing I desire and that will I seek. Because I'm going to tell you, the days that are coming very, very soon, in fact, I will argue the door's already been opened, are going to be days that the world has never known before. The darkest, most unimaginable days in the history of the world. And that's not, my, that's not me exaggerating. It's not my opinion. Yeshua says this. He says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Yeshua is expressing here that what is coming that's unfolding right now is beyond anything that you could have imagined, beyond anything that the world has experienced. We're talking about cataclysmic devastation. We're talking about unmitigated violence and hatred and persecution. We're talking about men standing in awe over the things that have come upon the world. We're talking about a world being plagued with fear and that fear beating down the door of the church. This is what we're talking about. And unless we get to the place where David is at and the beautiful wisdom and the heart and the faith that he expresses in Psalm 27, there's no way you are gonna make it. You will compromise. You will bend the knee to the beast. And so today we're gonna do some more prepping. And that really echoes David's closing statement. And I want to begin by taking you to the writer of Hebrews. I love the hall of faith. The writer brings our heritage to the table. It's a heritage we don't often like to consider, but this is what it is. In Hebrews 11, 35, or yeah, 35 at the back end, it says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. This is the heritage of our faith. See, the the reality is, is for the righteous, it hasn't always been easy. In fact, the template is hell. And, And, you know, the apostles are a great example of this. James killed by the sword, by Herod, nonetheless, during Passover. Interesting. We talked about Peter. Peter was crucified under the rule of Nero, this Antichrist. Paul was beheaded also under this Antichrist. It's an amazing thing when you go to the book of Revelation, when when we talk about the things that happened to the apostles, especially Paul, we read this. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Perhaps one of those souls that John saw was in fact the apostle Paul. Why were they beheaded? Why are these individuals in the faith 
martyred. Well, we're told for their witness to Yeshua and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. It's the structure of the faith. This is the testimony of two. They declared Yeshua as the Messiah and they kept his commandments, the commandments of God. They would not compromise and Paul was beheaded for it. There's another man that's quite famous for the very same situation, John the Baptist. And I want to bring you into that world for a moment. Because John the Baptist, his ministry, highly prophetic. We're told John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And this is important. Let this sink in. John was to come and herald the coming of the Messiah, coming in the spirit of Elijah. And when he came on the scene, man, Yeshua's coming was so quick. It followed that spirit of Elijah. And that spirit of Elijah went forth. And what did it do? He bore witness to the light, to the testimony of Yeshua. Oh, and guess what? He declared the law of God. He declared the commandments of God. He stood before kings. He stood before Herod. And he actually said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. I mean, this is Psalm 119, 46. I will declare your testimonies before kings and I will not be ashamed. This is what John did in the spirit of Elijah, heralding the coming of the Messiah, declaring what is lawful. And it got him killed. Literally beheaded. Let it sink in because guess what's coming? Guess what the Lord's going to do? The spirit of Elijah is coming back. The spirit of Elijah is going to meet toe to toe the spirit of the Antichrist. As the spirit of the Antichrist sweeps over this earth, the spirit of Elijah is going to meet it. And there's going to be men, anointed men, God has called to bring people back to repentance, to bring them back to the truth, to bring them back to Yeshua, to the law. And all war is going to break out. Now, I want to jump into the book of Daniel. And we looked at this verse. I didn't get to spend enough time on it. I want to go further into the passage. I want to take you into the book of Daniel. And, you know, as you look at Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, it talks about the Antichrist. And even in chapter 9. But it talks about this rise of the Antichrist. And this Antichrist would, would, would come out of Greece. And, it, and it would, there would be four horns, and out of this would come a little horn. And, and, and this one would be known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, I, I want to take you to Daniel and show you what is said. In verse 32, we read this, chapter 11. Those who do wickedly against the covenant. It's referring to God's covenant. We're talking about... The Aser at Hadeverim, we're talking about his law. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he, meaning the Antichrist, shall corrupt with flattery. In other words, you will become friends with the devil when you turn your back on God. You will be praised, you will be commended by the world. You will become like one of them. And see, the world believes their champion this honorable, this noble cause, whether it's killing children in the womb, whether it's committing immorality, anything that walks away and is not inhibited by the law of God, that they see this as liberty and freedom. Anyone that participates in that will be honored by the world. Then it goes on and says, but... The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people who know their God. 1 John 2, 3. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's the people who know their God. They're not going to compromise allegiance and obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
They will not do it. They will be carrying out great exploits. And what is the context? Well, let's talk about this for a second. When you read the book of Daniel, and it has this prophecy of Antiochus Epiphanes rising in the second century BC, there was truly a fulfillment of prophecy of what Daniel spoke of, but it is inaugurated, meaning there's another application later, and it's at the end of the age. And why is that important? It's important because the people that know their God, they're going to carry out great exploits. Do you understand? It is literally in the context of the rise of the Antichrist. When all hell breaks loose, when persecution breaks forth, they're going to be men and women that will not compromise and God will be doing great things in the midst of the insanity. To those who are faithful. To those who are faithful. And in verse 33, and those of the people who understand shall instruct many. God will anoint men and women and he will give them, the, they'll move in the power of the Holy Spirit. They have understanding in his word. He will raise up shepherds, preachers, and teachers, and they will go forth and they will do what John did. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you go to chapter 12, it actually says they turn many back to righteousness. It's a ministry of repentance. And then we read this. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, meaning they're going to be killed. By captivity, they'll be going to be thrown into prison and plundering. This is where the state comes in and literally relieves you of every personal property you have from your house to your bank accounts to leave you with nothing. You will be plundered. These are, these are the things that are going to happen by those who are carrying out great exploits. Some of them are going to fall. And yet, some of those of understanding shall fall. Why? We get this explanation to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time. Do you understand any time there's a time of testing, it is purification. The calamity, the pain, the suffering, the persecution, it's a time of purification. This is why Paul says we're to glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. There's a transformation that will take place in your heart. The leaven you hadn't found magically comes out in a time where you're in total despair, where you're suffering, you know, whatever that call is, whether you're going to be by the sword, whether you're going to be imprisoned, whether you're going to be plundered, whatever the case may be, the moment these things start to happen, man, purification comes. Now all of a sudden you said, Lord, Yeshua, come. Now I'm not distracted with the things of the world. Now I'm not trying to build my kingdom here because I'm confronted with the reality of what's going to happen in eternity. Purification. This is what happens. You know, in Deuteronomy 8, we read, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to what? To humble you and test you to know what you, was in your heart. That wilderness was hell. There's no food, there's no water, there's nothing but death. There's no provision. There's no grocery stores and there's certainly no coffee shops. There was nothing. And how much time did Israel have to prepare to grab all their belongings out of Egypt? They were driven out of Egypt in the middle of the night. Driven into this wilderness, he allows them to hunger. He allows them to thirst. They're in need, basic essentials to test them. What does God want to see? It says he wants to know what's in their heart, but what is he looking for in our hearts? Whether or not they would keep the commandments of God. Do you understand? So when all hell breaks loose, 
with the rise of the Antichrist and darkness covers this land and the persecution comes and the trials come, God is watching. He is watching how you are going to respond to very, very uncomfortable situations. What we don't want to see is Christians caving into fear. Christians bending the knee to the beast and compromising because if they don't, they'll be plundered. Or if they don't, they'll be thrown in prison. Or if they don't, they'll be killed. This is what God is looking for. I want to take you to the book of Maccabees. Having gone to the, you know, the, you know, the prophecies in Daniel, and specifically with the rise of the Antichrist, as I said, were fulfilled in the second century BC. And we have the recordings of what happened in the fulfillment of those prophecies and the books of the Maccabees, which used to be included in the King James. The original King James 1611 included the book of the Maccabees. It had the Apocrypha. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a tragedy that it's been taken out because I'm going to tell you, maybe you've heard me say this before and I'll say it again. The book of Maccabees is one of the clearest pictures we have in regard to the modus operandi of the Antichrist. You want to understand how he's going to move and act and behave? What he's going to do to the church in the last days? Read this story. There's some profound lessons here, and I'm just going to give you a snapshot. I want to draw from this because there's so much that we need from this story. From them came forth the sinful root, Antiochus Epiphanes, which, you know, Antiochus gave himself the name Epiphanes. It means God manifest. So Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus, he had been a hostage in Rome. He began to reign in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks, which is 175 BC. In those days, certain renegades, meaning false prophets. They came out from Israel and misled many. Now, you know, one of the things that we've talked about that we know that we're in the last days is with this glut and this rise of all these false prophets coming across to the churches, not even just in America, but throughout the world. Well, here's the situation. The Antichrist has risen up and what is happening? False prophets are rising up within Israel. We're within the children of God. This is the body of the Lord. These are the people God entered into covenant with. These false prophets went out and misled many. And look at what they say. Saying, you guys get my clicker back. There, there we go. Let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles around us. Do you see what they're doing? In other words, let us bend the knee to the beast. Let us acquiesce to the agenda of the Antichrist. Let's join the world. Why do they say this? This is huge. For since... We separated from them. Many disasters have come upon us. So because of the turmoil, because of the persecution, the affliction, the hatred, the answer, the false prophets are bringing to the church, to the people of God, is abandon the ways of the Lord and let's serve the Antichrist. Let's serve the beast. Why? Because things aren't going well. Okay, we've been serving the Lord and nothing good has come out of it. We've only been met with heartache. And this goes right back to Malachi, right? Where, they, where they, the children of God, they rise up and say, it's useless to serve the Lord. What profit is if we kept his covenant? When we walk as mourners, listen to me. When you allow your circumstances to dictate your allegiance to God, it's over. It's over. Your circumstances, and this is the time of testing, 
that God's looking for to see what's in your heart, you want to be able to overcome and say, this is not going to shake me. It's not going to move me. If I have to die, now is my time. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When you can say that with your heart, I know you're ready. When you can say that and mean that, you are ready. Jeremiah was sent to the children of Israel. He was sent to turn the, 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 the Jewish people back to their God, to come home. And this is what we read in Jeremiah 44, 16. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. So Jeremiah comes to them. He expresses the word of the Lord, come home. He gave the message that John the Baptist gave, repent, repent. He gave that message, but they're not gonna have it. And they give us a little bit of understanding as to why but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven, to pour out drink offerings to her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we have plenty of food and we're well off and we saw no trouble. See, even in our story in Maccabees, Antiochus came to the people and said, he will bless them with silver and gold. Just come and worship. Satan will bless you all day long with all the comforts of this world. He will give you your heart's desire. At what cost? At what cost? And so here, they, the, 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 the Jewish people are recognizing, oh, we're so blessed in worshiping the queen of heaven, financial security, safety, prosperity. And then we read this. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. It does, it, it, they're, they're looking at this going, it's totally pointless to serve the Lord. And that's exactly the lies the devil is peddling in those moments to prevent us from drawing near to the Lord, regardless of circumstances, regardless of how bad things get. Your only hope is to draw near to the Lord, regardless of what goes on in this life. No circumstances should be making that decision for you. We got to put our faith and trust in the Lord. Moving back to Maccabees. For since we separated from them, many disasters have come upon us. Moving ahead, we see the response. The proposal pleased them. You think about that. The proposal, please, these false prophets have had a massive impact. And some of the people eagerly went to the king who authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. In other words, we've received all these Jewish people that were called to serve and honor the Lord. But now the beast, this antichrist says, now you're part of our family. He's authorized them. Yes, now you're part of the, the, the world system. And many of the people, everyone who forsook the law, joined them. And they did evil in the land. Again, this is the impact of false prophets going forth. They're wreaking havoc on the sheep. These are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're, they're bringing a message supposedly that's going to bring blessing and comfort and financial security. It is going to bring eternal death. And they've got these people to walk away from God's law. They forsook the law. I mean, this is the, this is the modus operandi of the Antichrist. And then we continue, verse 56. The books of the law that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. See, because with the rise of the Antichrist, guess what? The Antichrist hates and is intolerant to the law of God. 
It is not compatible with his system. Everything that the B stands for is against God's holy law. And those things must be eradicated. Literally going out and burning Bibles to destroy the holy word of God. Now you think about that. Because when I look at something like this, and you know you're living in scary times when the church is actually heading up this cause. See, when you can have your pastors and preachers and teachers come out and tell you the law doesn't matter, you're not under the law, it's eradicated, it's done away with. That is a frightening thought. That is the mind of the Antichrist. And we were told, Paul warned us that deceivers would go out deceiving and being deceived. You wonder what time we're living in right now. Don't wonder. Of people proclaiming Jesus and worshiping the devil from the pulpit. Anyone found possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the law, meaning I did it, was condemned to death by decree of the king. It's interesting, literally in the Maccabees, it mentions that they were prohibited from keeping the Sabbath. They were prohibited from doing those things within God's word. And if you were found observing a commandment of God, you're worthy of death. This is what is coming. When the devil starts to legislate lawlessness, as you are seeing literally in our own state, let alone throughout the country. When you see this spirit of Antichrist legislating lawlessness, what is following is the complete legislation against the word of God. It's, 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 we're going to be painted as terrorists. We're going to be painted as domestic terrorists. You're going to be painted as haters. Because when you legislate lawlessness, if you're going against the move of the state, you become the enemy of the state. It's coming. Pay attention. This is coming very, very soon. Verse 58. They kept using violence against Israel, against those who were found month after month in the towns. See, the enemy is going to be relentless. Now, keep in mind, there was no violence against those in Israel that defected. Oh, there was blessing. There was silver, there was gold, there was prosperity. There was this worldly kindness, this fellow companionship that, that, that the Antichrist would offer you, friends with the king. No, what this is talking about is those that wouldn't compromise, that wouldn't get rid of their copies of the Torah. They held fast to it, that they wanted to walk in the word. And so the Antichrist becomes relentless. And notice, I mean, when you dig in further into that, he sends out inspectors going from town to town to what? To ensure compliance. He wanted everyone in his territory, you will be compliant. It fascinates me because as you go to the book of Revelation, there is one particular passage that is very clear where the Antichrist moves to ensure compliance. And what is that? Well, that's found in chapter 13, verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The exact same modus operandi that you see being woven in this tapestry of the Maccabees of the Antichrist, ensuring compliance, it's coming. It's gonna come in the form of, you're not gonna be able to buy the simplest things from gas. You won't even be able to buy a car to put gas in it. You won't be able to sell it if you needed to. You won't be able to buy and sell a house. You won't be able to buy or sell food. You'll have no ability to pay your bills. 
The whole concept is, is the Antichrist is going to tell you, if you don't get on my system, you don't do it my way, I'm locking you out of society. You have no ability to gain provision. You want to know what's amazing? Is when you read headlines like this. Reuters, a total of 134 countries representing 98% of the global economy are now exploring digital versions of their currencies with over half in advanced development, pilot, or launch stages. That isn't the end of the story. Then you read situations like this. The UDPN is the most advanced interoperable global payments network for regulating digital currencies, including regulated stable coins and central bank digital currencies. The UDPN promotes financial inclusion by allowing enterprises worldwide to connect with centralized and decentralized digital currency systems directly. Do you understand what they're talking about? They've got the network, the framework. It's not just about having technology to utilize digital currency with your local bank. We are talking about a single gateway for all to transact in. There's the infrastructure exists. For the first time in the history of the world, this statement can now come to pass on a global scale. For the first time, Ever. It's amazing that when you read the book of Revelation and you go to chapter 11, it talks about the two witnesses that come to Yerushalayim. There's a, there's, there's a really peculiar statement that is made that it recognizes that the whole world will see these two witnesses and they will see their dead bodies. The whole world. How does that happen? For the first time in the history of the world, you know, cell phones and cameras with media and our technology, within 60 seconds, you could be live streaming through one of these media outlets and the entire world can watch. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Don't come and ask me whether I think we're in the last days. Please don't. If you've been with me for any time at all, we are in the last days. Israel is back in the land. One of the most significant aspects of Bible prophecy that has to happen for the end times to unfold. And it's not just about Israel being back in the land. Oh, now they're talking about, the UN is talking about dividing Jerusalem. That is an end time prophecy heralding the coming of the Messiah. And they're literally talking about it right now. And as we started this entire series, we have a UN we are told in Bible prophecy that the nations will come together, they will unite as one. That has to happen. And then you take it a step further, you think about we have unmitigated violence erupting throughout the world. It's recognized all over people, even secular pundits. It's, it's, it's amazing to listen to the commentary. They are literally going, what is going on? What is wrong with people? How did we get here? It just seems like it happened overnight. If that isn't enough, you have sexual immorality saturating this entire globe. Truly, Yeshua said that he would come back, that the time he would come back in would be as the days of Noah and the days of Lot. We would have to see what we see right now before the Messiah comes back. Our entire world is saturated in this. And you look at that specific sin that existed in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. And it's being heralded all over the world right now, paraded in the streets. You think about the signs in the heavens. Millions of people traveling to look at the eclipse. Many people traveling to look at these blood moons. We have signs in the earth. We have signs all over the place. We're on the brink of a global famine, if you're paying attention. Only a scoffer would come out and say, we're not in the last days. Only a scoffer would say, where's the promise of his coming? Continuing on, verse 49. 
Now the days drew near for Mattathias to die. And he said to his sons, now Mattathias is this priest. And Mattathias has five sons. One of them is Judah Maccabee. He would rise up and deliver the people at the time. And so this Mattathias is a, is a very godly, God-fearing man. And he's drawing near to death and he's going to deliver a message to his sons. And I'm going to tell you right now, this message is for you. It's for everyone today. It's for this generation. He says this, arrogance and scorn have now become strong. It is a time of ruin and furious anger. I, I mean, we're, we're reading today's new newspaper. Arrogance and scorn have become strong. Now, my children... Show zeal for the law. This is the message. Show a radical zeal for God's holy law. And then he adds this, and give your lives for the covenant of our ancestors. Be willing to die for the faith. You know, Revelation says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. In chapter 12, it says they did not love their lives to the death. Paul, as I mentioned, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. This is the mentality. This is the message for today. Give your lives for the covenant of the Lord. You know, when, have we counted the cost? You know, when, when you receive Jesus and, you know, you, all your needs are met and you're very, very comfortable and things are going well, our math gets bad. You know, that's bad, that, that's bad math because we really don't count the cost. We're not thinking that, you know what? I will die for the gospel of Yeshua. I will give my life. I will not compromise. I'm willing to die. This is what it takes to go through what they're going through, what the Maccabees went through. This is what it takes. This is the message for us. We die for the cause of Jesus and obedience to the commandments of God. Verse 61, and so observe from generation to generation that none of those who put their trust in him will lack strength. Talk about hope and truth. None of those who trust, you put your faith in Yeshua and you will not lack this because this is what we need. But I can't get this to go through the calamity, the persecution, the tribulation, unless I trust. This all goes back to faith, putting our faith and hope in the Lord and drawing from that the strength that is available. But then he adds this, do not fear the words of sinners. Do not fear and I love what Yeshua says. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul and hell. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. You know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, of a sound mind. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear is the ultimate controller. It will control you. And the enemy will leverage that fear to your death. Absolute, take it to the bank. So Mattathias, beautiful words. Do not fear the words of sinners for their splendor will turn into dung and worms. Today they will be exalted, but tomorrow they will not be found because they will have returned to the dust and their plans will have perished. My children, be courageous and grow strong in the law, for by it you will gain honor. What do we need to do today? Grow strong in the law. The very thing that the enemy wants to convince you, you don't need. Isn't that interesting? It's exactly what you need. You need to draw from the word of the living God, the wisdom, the truth, the light that it holds, the power where the word of the king is, there's power. 
And so you look at this, what, what he lays out here, four things. Mattathias has commissioned us today. I mean, these are words of truth. The first two, trust in the Lord and grow strong in the law. And that is the structure of the faith. This is the very template, the very message woven throughout the book of Revelation. Where that drag is enraged with the woman, he goes to make war with the rest of her offspring who have the testimony of Yeshua and they keep the commandments. This is literally what Mattathias told his sons in the context of the rise of the Antichrist. This is profitable. We need this. And then he says, do not fear sinners. And then he said this, give your life for the covenant. You want the game plan? Do you want to know what we need, what we need to possess? This is it. We need to possess these things. I want to take you to the, back to the book of Joshua. And, and this is important because the Lord himself is talking to Joshua. And the context is, is prepare to go and take the land. It's the context. They're, they're going to go up and they're going to take the land. And prophetically, it's representative of us going into the kingdom of heaven, taking the land. So with that said, as we go to chapter one, verse six, the Lord says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. For to this people, you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. This is the Lord. And literally within a second, he reiterates the point of be strong and courageous. He doubles down on this. And listen to what it follows. That you may observe to do according to all the law. What is the measure of your faith? Your obedience to God. That's how we measure our faith. That's where we know who's a strong believer. The one who's given himself to the word of God. Totally submission. I mean, for you to do what this says, to do that you may observe according to all the law, you have to surrender. You have to give up your own value system. You have to live Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He will show you this is, this is righteousness. Walk in it. You will have to abandon a lot of emotion. You will have to abandon a lot of fear. You will have to abandon humanistic logic to do what God is commissioning Joshua to do. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, oh, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Exactly what we read in the Torah, right? You're, talk, you're to talk of his word, his commands, his law, when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Total consumption. Total meditation. This is, this is what we're called to do. And what's amazing is, is when you go to Proverbs 12, 25, we read this, and I'll put this up here with this. He says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Now, let me ask you something. As all hell breaks loose in this world and we begin to experience things that we've never known, do you think anxiety is gonna creep in to the hearts of men? You better believe it. And it does something. It causes depression. Listen to me. It causes hopelessness. Anxiety in your heart can bring you into a place of total hopelessness and doubt and fear. All these things destroy faith. How do you combat that? I love this as he continues. 
but a good word makes it glad. A good word, I'm gonna tell you the only place to get that good word. So how do you combat the anxiety, the insanity that is coming? You immerse yourself in his word. You feed on his faithfulness. You meditate on it day and night and you will have strength to endure. I mean, don't you love Yeshua's messages as you look at his teachings? He's like, hey, don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or about what you're gonna wear. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. He says, don't fear those who can kill the body, but not the soul. He says, see that you're not troubled. When nation rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom, we're talking Deut- or Matthew 24. We're talking about moving into the time of tribulation. And Yeshua says, see that you are not troubled. He keeps preaching that hope that strength, that power, that for his elect, no, we're not supposed to respond. We're told how the world's gonna be responding. It says that the men's hearts will fail them from the things that are coming upon the earth. They will be in total despair, wallowing in hopelessness. While the righteous are supposed to be carrying out great exploits, for the holy name of Yeshua. Amen. My soul melts from heaviness. You know, one of the things that I love most about the Psalms is the transparency. The things that the psalmist are going through, they're, they're vulnerable, they're transparent. They show you, he is showing you, I'm overwhelmed. What's the answer? He says, strengthen me according to your word. He recognizes the the way I'm going to get the strength that I need to endure to the end that I might be saved is the word. I can't put enough emphasis on how important it is that you're spending time in his word. Going back to Joshua, you're to meditate in it day and night, continuing that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. That's the purpose. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a beautiful message. This is the message that Yeshua taught. This is the message that Mattathias taught his five sons in the midst of the Antichrist. And so as we look at David's statement, how he closes this very prophetic psalm, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What an amazing way, what words of wisdom to literally wrap this up. Abba Father, we just give you praise and glory for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your word. And everywhere we go, Lord, Genesis to Revelation, you keep bringing us back to your word. You sent your prophets to your people to bring them back to your word. I pray that we become people of the word, that we become known as modern day Maccabees who will not abandon your Torah, who will not abandon our trust in Yeshua, but regardless of what we're faced with, that we will hold the line. There is compromise is just not an option. And Lord, I pray for the strength to give our lives to the death. That's the strength we need to where we won't hesitate in the moment that if it so is, has to be that we give our lives for your name's sake. That we give our lives for the truth. And I love what we read, Lord, in in Philippians. 
where your apostle Paul was imprisoned in chains, literally chained. And the impact that that made actually emboldened other believers to be more adamant about proclaiming the gospel of Yeshua. This work that the enemy does to quench the fire of the Holy Spirit actually it falls apart. Everything, all that work of the enemy falls apart. Your holy word, your holy name only gets more manifested. That is an awesome thought to me. That's encouragement. That the more Christians suffer, the more your gospel goes forth. What a profound thought. And so, Lord, I pray over this flock, this body that you have called. I pray for increased faith. I pray for strength. I pray for boldness to walk in your ways. I pray that you equip them to be able to give a defense for the gospel, for the hope that is in them. I pray for answered prayers, Lord. There's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of healing that is needed. And Lord, we pray over those situations because we have hope. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever in everything that I've seen that you have done is who you are today. That as the masses came to you to be healed, not one of them left unhealed. Not one of them left the same. Total transformation. Total download of the power of God. And we just thank you for that mercy, Lord, and that goodness. We thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Oh, Lord, may that be ingrained in our mind. With every step we take, that we know that you are with us. You're not going to leave us. And if that means to go to death, you'll be there. If that means into prison, you will be there. If that means total plundering, you'll, you're there. Help us to do God math and to count the cost, to pick up our cross and follow you. Because Yeshua, your words are true that he who loves his life in this age will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Words to literally live by. And so we just thank you for your goodness, Lord. And we pray this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen.